to, to my shame, uh, I've only climbed Ben Nevis once, and maybe you have climbed it more than that, but it was a memorable experience for me, and there's a number of things uh, which I recall uh, about that experience. One was the ease uh, of climbing it, so don't be put off uh, if you're in that part of the world uh, to give it a go, because there's basically a path uh, that the whole way up, they used to race four by fours to the top of Ben Nevis in, in times past, and so it's a really manageable experience. The second thing that I, I remember vividly was that the number of ruined pianos uh, that were lying around uh, the mountain of Ben Nevis. Again, they had a race in the past of teams pulling a piano to the top of Ben Nevis and evidently it was too much for some of them and they had ditched them perhaps on the way up or maybe on the way down and there's these ruined pianos spread across parts of Ben Nevis. But the most memorable feature of the experience was that the incredible view uh, from the top, the vistas that you could see. You thought you were standing on the top of the world. There were numerous mountains, high mountains, which just seemed like small hills in comparison to the height on which you were situated on Ben Nevis. You could look out over the sea. You could feel so close to the clouds in the heavens. What an experience of standing on the top of this mountain. And it's that kind of experience that, that we have as we come to chapter 19. Uh, perhaps this will come more to you if you read through the book of Job over these three weeks that we're studying it together. But as you read through the, the earlier chapters in this second major section of dialogue from 3 to 27, you, you will discover that this indeed is a high point within the book of Job. Handel's Messiah pulls out various parts of, of God's word and it, it pulls out this part, this high point in the book of Job. One writer calls it the most memorable, memorable passage in Job, especially this 25th verse, well known to us. And so Job, from chapter 3 up until this point and beyond this point to chapter 27, is engaged in this verbal boxing uh, with his three so-called friends, Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad. Uh, they're having a go at him. Uh, they're fastened into this, this one and only understanding of suffering, that suffering is the result of sin, personal sin, individual sin, that, that somehow this man, Job, who's protesting his, his innocence has got to have some big sin in his life. And they can't get away from this argument. This is the only explanation that they have for his suffering. And Job again and again argues against them. And we have it here in this chapter. He's feeling the, 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 the affliction and oppression of their argument. I went running uh, on one occasion uh, with a friend who was, was a lot fitter uh, than myself. And so after two miles, uh, I, I told this friend to, to head on. We, we passed a walker uh, uh, t -t together as, as we went round the forest. And, and then we came to, to a point and I said to my friend to run on. And as I jogged very slowly after he had left me, I encountered this runner again. And the runner said to me, oh, where's your friend? Have you burned him off? This was the only understanding this walker had of me being on my own. But there was a far better realistic explanation for the situation. And these friends of Job have only got one explanation. He's got to have sinned in a big way. And Job's been battling and wrestling with that. Our focus is, is on these, these incredible words from verse 21 to the end of chapter 19. 
And we, we want to, to think of them and, and carry them away into our life and community the, in this week. And there's, 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 a, there's a stepped progression in, in Job's words here. And he begins with, with a plea in, in verses number 21 to 24. He's asking for things now of his friends. And, and there's two things that he's, he's asking He's asking for mercy, and he's asking for memory. He's asking for mercy in, in verse number 21. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, O oh, you my friends. He uses a, a kind of image in, in these verses, doesn't he, as he pleads for mercy, as of, of dogs uh, chasing their prey, or of hounds after the fox. They're relentless. They won't give up. They've got the scent. They, they, they intend to, to pursue the animal until, until it drops. And, and this is the image uh, 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 that, that, that Job uses here in verse 22, why do you, like God, pursue me? And, and the next line here is, 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 is capturing Job's experience and, and thought at this moment, why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Albert Barnes comments on this and explains this for us. Job's thinking at this point is, in relation to his friends, well, look at me. I am tortured physically. I, I have this rash. I have this itch. I have these ulcerations all over my body. Are you not satisfied with my flesh? Is it not enough that I'm suffering physically? Are you going to torment me mentally as well? See in verse number two, how long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? He's already down in the dust. He's already physically humiliated. Are they not satisfied with that? Are they going to provide mental torture as well? And so he says to them, have mercy on me, O oh, you my friends. He understands perhaps more then he realizes in verse number 21, the hand of God has touched me. Wasn't this what Satan said to God in chapter 1 and, and verse 11 that we thought of this morning? Satan challenging God, put out your hand and, and touch him. Take away his wealth and his health, this family, and see if he still worships you then. And Job seems to have grasped as something of this. The hand of God has touched me. And so you, my friends, you who are in my presence, you who are speaking to me, you who are beside me here in my grief, you have mercy on me at this time. And so this is his plea. He wants, he wants mercy. Just, just back off. Just give me space here. Don't add to my physical pain the mental torment of this wrong reasoning and philosophy that you have that great suffering always has great sin behind it. But a second thing that Job requests here is, is memory in verse number 23 and 24. He wants his condition and arguments written down, put into a book. And, and he was granted that as we have this book of Job. He, he also, in the, in the imagery of his day, he, he wants this stele, this rock engraved and, and carved out and, and, and molten lead placed in this rock. And it was a, a common practice. King Darius I did this with uh, some of his outstanding commanders. He put their names uh, on this uh, piece of rock that, that would uh, catch the sun and, and people's attention would be drawn to these outstanding commanders. And Job wants something similar for his experience, for his arguments. His, his reasoning is, 
The people of my time and circle do not understand me. They're misinterpreting my experience. But I want the next generation to be able to read about my experience and properly understand what has happened to me. And he asks that his story would be written down so that we and, and others after him would, would assess it fairly and understand his innocence and the ways of God with him. It's always a challenge for historians when to write a biography, when they can properly assess a life. Is it too early to write a definitive biography of the queen? To recognize her place within our nation and within the world, the influences which she had, the, the role which she played. Is it too early to do that now? Do we need to wait a decade before we could properly assess her actions and her reign? Sometimes we're too close to a person, to a time, to fully understand the impact of a life or a circumstance. Job is wanting this. He wants another generation with fresh eyes and a bit of distance to read his story and properly interpret his experience. And it's hard for us to help sufferers, isn't it? And our Wednesday evening is, is helping us to think more about this. To say the right thing, in the right way, at the right time, is a hard thing to do. We know the phrase, a friend in need is a friend indeed, but how can we be a friend? Liz Trust is, is still maintaining that her policy is right, her policy, economic policy is good, it's just the wrong time. To have that policy in another time, it would be the most effective policy, but it's just the wrong time and circumstances now. And it's hard to say the right things at the right time, in the right way, to the right people. But perhaps Job's plea helps us a little here. What he wanted from his friends was mercy. Perhaps less words, perhaps no words, just mercy. Perhaps younger people can see things better than older people at times. Perhaps another generation can interpret circumstances and events with a clearer understanding. Former generations, they used, some of them uh, used to uh, despise uh, having a television, but would smoke like a train. The current generation uh, recognizes the bad effects uh, of smoking. Perhaps new eyes, fresh insights, a bit of time does bring new and better ways and understanding for us. The church used to think in the 14th century that the earth was flat, but we know better now. Calvin maintained that communion should be held every week, but the church at Geneva wasn't ready for his opinions. And here is Job, and he, he recognizes that sometimes a story, a circumstance, can be better understood in a different time. So here's his plea. A plea for mercy. A plea for memory. And maybe that's your plea. But he moves up on this to this second step. That's the persuasion that he has in this 25th verse, the most memorable verse, and rightly so, from the book of Job. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And, and, and we get what, what he says in the context, don't we? He, he's, 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 he's turning 
in this contrast from what he calls in verse 21, my friends, to this other person in verse 25, my Redeemer. My friends aren't understanding me. My friends are wrongly interpreting my circumstance, but I know that my Redeemer lives. And he's using Redeemer in the sense of vindicator, the one who will stand up for me. And, and, and while the Redeemer idea was developed in the time of Moses, much later than Job in the time of Abraham and Isaac, yet the concept of Redeemer was an ancient one. Someone who would avenge the death of a family member. Someone who would buy back land that a family member had to sell because they were getting into debt. The Redeemer was one who stood up for the family. And here is Job and he has this confidence that while his friends misunderstand his circumstance, his Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand up for him upon the earth. It's a, it's a legal term he uses at the end of verse 25 to stand up for someone in defense of them in court. And Job is thinking of the divine redeemer, the one who has afflicted him, the one who has pursued him in verse 22, the one who seems to be against him, of whom he's spoken in verse, uh, throughout this, the early part of this chapter, verse number nine, he stripped me of my glory, he's taken the crown from my head. God has broken me down on every side, yet by faith, Job believes that God is his redeemer, that he knows the truth and that he will stand up for him at the last and vindicate him and declare that he is innocent and righteous before him. And isn't this the experience that Job had? That in the last chapters of this book that we will come to soon in our studies. In verse 5 of the last chapter he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. He knew about the Redeemer. He knew about a righteous God who cared for his people, who loved them, who defended them. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. And here in this verse he's speaking of him. I know my Redeemer lives. But then he goes on to say in that verse, but now my eye sees you. I see your work. I receive your vindication. I witness that you are my Redeemer. Perhaps at school, we experienced the, the odd occasion of, of bullying, especially in the canteen when you open your lunchbox and someone from a few years uh, above you would come around and threaten bodily harm on you if you didn't give them your Mars bar. And you perhaps uh, as, as a young pupil might, might hand this over tremblingly but with a few words. Just you wait till my older sister comes. She'll sort this out. And this is Job's thinking here. Here's his friends. They don't get him. They don't understand him. They are opposed to him. Their philosophy is that he is guilty. But he says, I've got a redeemer. And he will stand up for me in the judgment. Perhaps you've been vilified. Perhaps you've been wrongly condemned. Perhaps your character has been maligned. It's been the experience of David, of Daniel, of Christ, of Job here. We too have a redeemer, a vindicator. And Psalm 37 verse 6 assures us, doesn't it, that he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So here is Job pleading for mercy and memory 
But moving up on to this, this second step of, of persuasion. But I have a redeemer. And he will stand up for me. But there's a third step, isn't there? He moves beyond the pleading with his friends. He moves beyond this persuasion of the Redeemer. He moves on to, to prophecy. In verses 26 and 27. And here he's no doubt speaking far beyond he, what he understands and, and fully recognizes. He's, he's taken up by the Spirit of God here and, and speaking wonderful things far beyond his time. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job perhaps was thinking of his recovery from his illness, of restoration of his farmlands and, and of his herds. He, he was thinking of a future earthly experience of restoration and recovery by his vindicator and redeemer, something which he did experience and enjoy for 140 years after his trial. But he's speaking far beyond that. He's speaking of resurrection and as Anderson says, the hope of the resurrection resides in these verses. He's thinking not only of his personal experience of death and corruption and then resurrection, but the corporate experience of the church of Christ. When afflictions and trials and persecutions will be at an end physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and we will enter in to the very presence of God. And we shall see for ourselves, Our eyes shall behold. And not another. Job's experience is no doubt linked. To the corporate experience. What happened to him. In, in his going down into the depths of affliction. And corruption. And yet being brought again in restoration. Is for us a type of. Of that entering into death and then resurrection into glory. No doubt he'd heard of the experience of Enoch. Being taken into the presence of God. Perhaps also of Isaac up on Mount Moriah. Not dying but being brought back to Abraham as a type of resurrection. And all of this is underpinning this assertion of Job. That after my skin has been destroyed. Yet in my flesh, in that very flesh that has decomposed and been buried, I shall see God. Resurrection shall come. There have been many photos of vindication and solidarity that have been studied and examined and spoken about. Perhaps one of the greatest ones was from the life of the Queen when Prince Andrew suffered his great fall and humiliation of her riding at the very edges of the, the royal estate so that the cameras could catch them side by side on horseback riding together. And the Queen was saying to the press and to the nation that whatever he has done, there will always be a mother's love for her son. And here is Job, recognizing his weakness, his frailty, how he has fallen from the heights of power and influence and esteem. He's spoken here of, in verse 18 of the, the young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. What a fall, what a humiliation he's experienced. But in the depths of his despair and darkness, he knows the Redeemer is with him. And that one day, he will stand in the very presence of God. That Redeemer can be our Redeemer. The one who can vindicate us on the last day when we stand 
before Almighty God, recognizing on our worthiness the original and actual sin within our lives. On that day, we need such a vindicator, such a savior. As we repent of our sins and receive Jesus Christ, the Son of God, by faith, we, like Job, can say these great words. I know that my Redeemer lives and that the last day he will stand up for me. This chapter speaks to the depressed, doesn't it? As Job climbs up his three steps from plea to persuasion to prophecy, speaks to the depressed, comes at a low point in his life. He's been going through rounds of debate and, and, and argument with, with his friends. But he's described here the loneliness, the isolation, the despair of his experience. But what a, an encouragement to, to, to those who, who, who are afflicted by such darkness that even in that depression and despair, he has this hope, this hope of redemption and vindication. It was Thomas Fuller in 1650, that English theologian who said that the the darkest hour is just before the dawn. And his point was that we don't know what's around the corner. Circumstances can change so quickly, but that is different to what's happening here, isn't it? Here is Job, even in his darkest hour. And there is light, there is hope, there is faith in his Redeemer. The chapter speaks to, to those of us who are overcritical of others, doesn't it? It ends with this, this warning in verses 28 and 29 that Job directs to his cronies. He, here he imagines them speaking how we will pursue him. We're not going to give this up. We're not going to listen to his arguments. We're, we're right here. Job is guilty. We're going to pursue him. And the, this famous phrase, verse 28, the root of the matter is found in him. Uh, we use it often in a good sense, uh, don't we? That the person might not be the finished article, but the root of the matter is in him, we might say. But this has been used in a, a negative sense. They're arguing the, 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 the guilt is in Job. It, it's in there. The root of the matter is found in the cause of his trouble is inside of him. We're just going to identify it and draw it out. And Job says to these overcritical, hardened friends, you're pointing the finger at me. Just remember, there will be a judgment for you as well. The UK has been lambasting glo global pollution. Well, all the time, Sheffield City Council has been cutting down 3,000 trees. We'll all be judged. And when we're critical of others, there's a judgment waiting for us. But for all of us, this chapter speaks to us, doesn't it? That speaks to us perhaps in that short line at the end of verse 27. My heart faints within me. And what's causing him to faint in this moment? Is it his overwhelming suffering? Is it the darkness of his experience? Is it the weight that's come down upon him? The sorrow that's burdening this man and breaking this man? What's making him go weak at this moment? It's the overwhelming love of God that even he will see God for himself that his eyes will behold him and not another and it's added on to that that he says that thought makes my heart faint within me 
for a way to finish our worship services today, to reflect on that, what moves us, what thrills us, what causes us great joy. If you want the Hebrew here, it is my kidneys go into my stomach. My emotions are really moved by this incredible hope that lies before me, that we will dwell in the presence of God, resurrected, vindicated, glorified forever.